Hello, I'm Rick Klima, director of the Common Reading Program at Appalachian State University, on whose behalf it's my privilege to welcome you to this evening's keynote address by John Elder Robeson, author of this year's Common Reading book. The Common Reading Program at Appalachian State each year chooses and provides to first year and transfer students a book, the Common Reading Book, with the intention that this will promote and guide intellectual interdisciplinary discussions on the topic of the book among the students and with their faculty at the university. And the Common Reading Book for this year is Robeson's, entitled Be Different, My Adventures with Asperger's, and My Advice for fellow Aspergians, misfits, families, and teachers. John Elder Robeson is an active participant in the autism rights movement, notably in the ongoing discussion of ethical and legal issues related to autism therapy, services, and intervention. He served on the WHO Steering Committee that shaped definitions related to autism that are now used worldwide. He's the Neurodiversity Scholar in Residence at the College of William & Mary, where he founded the school's neurodiversity program, one of the first of its kind at any American university. He's a member of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, which is charged with creating the U.S. Strategic Plan for Autism. He serves as a neurodiversity advisor to the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, as well as on boards at the NIH and CDC, where he's known for his position that people with autism should have the lead voice in defining autism research goals. In his younger years, Robeson worked as a roadie slash engineer in the music business, where he's best known for creating special effects guitars for the rock band Kiss and machines that synthesized sound for Pink Floyd. Later, he founded J.E. Robeson Service, a center that specializes in the care and restoration of classic high-end European automobiles including brands such as Bentley, Rolls-Royce, and Jaguar. Anne Robeson is a New York Times best-selling author whose works, which are the most widely read accounts in the world on life with Asperger's, have been translated into more than 15 languages and sold in more than 60 countries. And he's authored hundreds of articles for educators, scientists, medical professionals, and the public. And he's right behind this curtain. Please join me in welcoming to this stage and to App State, John Elder Robeson. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for your introduction and, and thank you for taking the time this evening to, to join me here. Um, it's a kind of a cool thing sometimes to listen to introductions like we just heard, and it's hard to believe any of that's really true for me being a kid that they threw out of high school when I was 16 years old. That's just, it's just hard to believe how, how far it's gone since then. It's kind of neat to be here in North Carolina, I was uh, born in Georgia. I was born in the South. And uh, I've had some connection with this part of North Carolina over the years. I had a cousin, Billy. Of course, if you're a Southern family, all of you have cousin Billies and Jimmy Bobs and Bobby Rays and stuff too. And uh, and you know, my cousin Billy's a little bit older than me, and we always admire our older cousins, and cousin Billy 
he is in the business of making liquor up here in the mountains. And uh, one day, I stopped seeing Billy, and uh, he didn't come around anymore. Nobody really said anything. And then my grandmother up and died a few years after that. And I uh, was at the funeral. I was in Chickamauga, Georgia. And uh, Billy comes to the funeral, and there's a fellow I'd never seen right there with him. And I asked who that was, and well, it turned out it was a U.S. Marshal because they let him out on a furlough from prison for the, for the funeral. So, so that was my first exposure to the mountains here in North Carolina. And the next exposure come a few years later when uh, I was out on the road with Kiss. So you heard that I, I made their guitars that shot rockets and blew fire and stuff, and and so these, um, these instruments were kind of finicky. This was not like it is today, where you buy a product in a store and you snap it together and it does its thing. I mean, in, in, back in those days, you could buy an electric guitar and you could take it out of the box and it would do its thing. I'll grant you that that happened even then. But there was no guitar you could take out of the box and have it shoot rockets across the room. And, and so... So they were kind of fearful of those things, and I had to travel on tour with them for a good bit of that time and ensure that they would work. And, um, and so at one show, we're playing here in, in Charlotte at the Civic Center, and, uh, and, and, and I, used to, I used to just be stunned at the dedication of some of the fans we would have. And, and there was this group, this group of girls and, and they arranged an age from like nine years old to 16. And they were there at the front at the, at the show. And, um, and they followed us back to the hotel. And so there we are, you know, it's like midnight. And I'm thinking, no good can come of this thing. You're an eight-year-old girl asleep in the hall and her sisters and stuff. And I asked them where they live. And they told me they lived up in the mountains. And, and they didn't have any way to get home. And, and I didn't know what to do, but I, I called. I, we, had a, we had limos, you know, that drove us around. And I, I got the limo driver rousted out of wherever he was partying elsewhere in the hotel because, you know, it was that kind of life. And, um, and I told the driver that uh, I had these girls. I wanted him to take home. And he looks at me, and he looks at them, and he says, son of a bitch, I never thought you were that kind. <laughs> and uh, and I, uh, I said, well, just take them home. And, uh, so anyway, he, um, he takes them up, loads them in the car, and he didn't come back until morning. They were like all the way up here. It was like a six-hour journey to take them up this dirt road in the middle of nowhere up here. And uh, so then I... That was my next experience here. And then the experience that came after that was all these years later, I became a trustee of the New England State Fair. And uh, we got this fellow, Sam, comes from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and he brings us our staging. You know, you probably, some of you have been to the State Fair down here in North Carolina and State Fairs, other places. And we got bands playing every weekend, and so we have to rent the stage, got to rent all that stuff. So Sam would come with the stage, and every year, Sam would bring us good local liquor from right around here. And so we always would cherish sitting backstage with Sam after the show, drinking his liquor. And, and I, was, uh, I was talking to one of the fellows here, and he told me there is actually some legal distilling here, but... Sam didn't have that kind of liquor. Anyway, those, uh, those are some of, the, some of the things I thought of coming here to see you. You know, it's really a remarkable thing how much has changed in the time since I was a, a kid to when I was a young adult like you are now and 
to where I am now looking back on all that at age 66. I think about when I was 15 years old and I was failing every single subject at Amherst High School. Instead of straight A's. And I had gotten almost straight A's in the fifth grade. And by the ninth grade, it was in a total state of collapse. And the teachers would say to me, either you're a bright boy, if only you would apply yourself. And then other teachers would say, you're just a dumb retard. What are you doing here? And and I kind of never knew what to say and do because if I could have just applied myself, for Christ's sake, don't you think I would have? I didn't want to get straight F's. And I stopped going to class. Teachers threatened me with that. What are they going to do with me? I was already failing everything. And the guidance counselor, he actually said to me, you know, you better think about what you're going to do because the Vietnam War is winding down and the Army's not going to take a high school dropout anymore. And so, with those great words of encouragement from the Amherst High School Counseling Department, I left school, but I was really fortunate because I had developed an interest in electronics and music. And even though I was failing in school, I was a great success, at least in my own mind, understanding electronics and music. Now, I didn't know all the words to all the songs, but I knew, I knew all the sounds. You know, I could listen to a song on the radio and I could tell if the lead guitar player was playing a Fender Telecaster or a Gibson Les Paul or some other kind of guitar. I could recognize the instruments. I couldn't necessarily recognize the songs, but I could recognize that. I could recognize the sounds of individual guitar players. I knew B.B. King's guitar the moment I would hear it. And, and I wanted more than anything to work in music. And, and at the same time, I'd gotten fascinated by electronics when my parents gave me an electronics kit and I, I couldn't make it work. And, and by the greatest stroke of fortune, my parents happened to be college professors, not in engineering. My mother taught uh, English and writing and poetry, and my father taught philosophy. But my mother had a girlfriend, and she said, Miriam's husband is an engineering professor. I'm sure he would love to help you make that thing work. Well, you can imagine how excited he would have been to make it work. And so he did what professors here probably still do. He gave me to the grad students. And the grad students realized that they had in hand this teenager who was smarter than a German shepherd and totally immune to university discipline because I wasn't a student and I was a professor's kid. And so they introduced me to wondrous physics experiments, like I learned how the craters on the moon are created. And you can look through a telescope and you can see those spatters. And they took me 300 feet up to the of our new graduate research center, where we rolled barrels of tar off the roof and we watched them hit the ground and replicate the craters on the moon. And, uh, and when I wasn't doing that, I spent time in the labs in Engineering East, taking things apart. And at first, all I did was take apart circuits and destroy them. But then I got to where I could put them back together. And I got to where I could fix things. And I got to where I could create things. And all the while, I was blending the music and the electronics. So I was, I was listening to the music, and I would hook an oscilloscope I would hook it 
to the signals from the amplifiers and I would look at it. And I taught myself how to recognize what a guitar looked like on the oscilloscope and I taught myself to recognize what a snare drum and a kick drum looked like on the oscilloscope. And, uh, and I began to learn how the electronic circuits shaped the sound. And so by the time I was 16 and I gave up on school, I had learned enough that I could fix and modify electric guitars and guitar amplifiers and, and organs and all that stuff. And even if Amherst High School didn't want me, the community of musicians where I lived, they loved me. And it's really just the merest chance that I did that, and that's ultimately what brought me here to you tonight. Because if I had dreamed about being the singer in the band, there was a million other people that dreamed of being singers in the band too, but how many people dreamed of fixing the electric guitars? How many people dreamed of making them sound different? I was kind of like the only one. And, uh, and that carried me pretty quickly from local bands to bigger and bigger shows. Um, some of you, you probably all heard of Woodstock, right? The festival in 1969. And, uh, and I, was, uh, I was a little too young to be at Woodstock. And Woodstock was actually not held in Woodstock, New York. It was held about 50 miles south of there. But the town of Woodstock, New York had long been a home for musicians and creative people. And I began working in music with musicians in Woodstock. And, um, and that led to working with bigger and bigger acts. One of the guys at Woodstock I, I was hooked up with was a fellow who was a bass player for Blood, Sweat, and Tears back then. There's a number of other bands that I, I worked with, and, and ultimately that led me into a stadium where there was this concert going on, and, and I was just a, you know, a guest, and um, they were having terrible trouble getting their sound system to work. And, um, and I was looking at the stuff, and I was looking at what the guy's doing. And you know, I still was just a kid, and I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have really any friends at all. I wouldn't have known how to talk to any of you if I had, had seen you, because at that time, you'd all been a couple of years older than me, and I'd have been terrified to even open my mouth to any of you about, about ourselves or school or anything like that. But when it came to that guy trying to make those amplifiers work, I had all the confidence in the world and I said, well, I can fix those. And the guy said, do you know about phase linear amplifiers? Well, I'd never seen a phase linear amplifier before. I said, sure. And, um, and he, said, um, he said, well, if you're serious, he said, I got a whole room full of these things back in Long Island City. And uh, you know, if you, wanna, if you think you can fix these things, you come on down and do it. And, um, and so the guy gives me his phone number and stuff. And, um, and I drive down there and a uh, place called Britannia Row Audio. I didn't have any idea what Britannia Row Audio is. And um, it's a big old radio studio and big like rehearsal space and stuff. And I said, where's the you know, amplifiers? And he says, they're in a room back here. So we go in back, and there's a room back there. It's the size of this whole backstage area. And it is stacked full of equipment, like hundreds of these things. And I said, this stuff's all broken? And he said, yeah, most of it. And uh, so I stayed down there, and I made it all work. And it turned out that Britannia Row was a sound company that Pink Floyd formed to put their sound equipment out on the road when they weren't touring. And, uh, and so from that moment on, I was kind of their engineer in the United States. And, um, and we went on to, to build a lot, of, uh, a lot of audio equipment, and we played a lot of rock and roll shows. We played English rock and roll, American rock and roll, we played disco, we played soul, we kind of did it all. And, uh, it's still probably one of the best times of my life. You know, I turned 21 riding the ferry 
from, uh, I think where it was, I think it was from St. John's, New Brunswick to Corner Brook, Newfoundland. It was an overnight ferry ride. And I was sitting up there on the top deck of the ferry. And, uh, and it, I was just, it was such a, such a magical thing. I was out on tour with April Wine. I didn't know who April Wine was, but the guys told me they're like the Rolling Stones of Canada. And they were, they were a huge band in Canada. And with April Wine, I probably played every hockey rank across the width of Canada. And, um, but it was, uh, it was just, it was, a, it was a magical time. And you know, music took me from being this total loser, dropout kid. All my life, people told me I was stupid, I was useless, I was lazy. They called me all kinds of names. But in the world of music, if you could make beautiful music, it didn't matter how you looked or how you acted. What mattered is you could make beautiful music. And, you know, and I didn't play a musical instrument, but I could make all the other instruments sing better. And, and you know, and that, that gave me a place in the world for the first time. Ultimately, though, it came to an end, and it, it kind of ended in a sad way. I, I got to working on bigger and bigger shows. And uh, one day, KISS is in, our, is in our studios rehearsing. They were going to get a monitor system from us. And, uh, and I got talking to the lead guitar player, Ace Freely. He was telling me he wanted to have a guitar blow fire. And it was the same deal. I still couldn't talk to a pretty girl, but I could assure him that absolutely, I can make a guitar blow fire. I can do it professionally, not just digging at the guitar with a chisel like you're doing. And, um, and he has Gibson send me a guitar. And, you know, I had a couple of friends by the time. I had a girlfriend, actually, by then. And, um, and so, so we did. We made that first guitar, and then we went on to make every other guitar that they put up on stage that shot fire or lit up or shot rockets or blew up or did anything else like that. And, um, and so that led to, led to other job offers to work on other shows, and I did other musical work. Um, and then I, I, got a, I got an invitation to go for a job interview as a director of research. Well, that's a really fancy sounding title, you know, for a high school dropout kind of kid. And it was outside of Los Angeles and it was for this company called Lucasfilms. And, um, and of course, who knows where I would be today if I became the director of Lucasfilms back there in the 1970s and what we would have done and seen on the movie screen. But none of that happened because I didn't call them back and I didn't go there for an interview because I thought that if I went there and they hired me, because everybody else I ever talked to about making things in electronics had hired me. And I thought, these people are going to hire me too. But these people aren't wanting some rock and roll animal to go on tour. They're wanting a director of research in a, in a real company. And they're going to find out that I'm this high school dropout and I'm just this nothing kid. And they're going to fire me and I'm on, going to be on the street in California and I'm going to starve. And I'm not going to do that. And, and not only did it scare me so badly about that, it made me think, I need to get a regular job somewhere around here in Western Massachusetts. And, uh, and so, at the same time, I saw this job ad that a toy company, Milton Bradley, they're part of Hasbro now. Uh, Milton Bradley was looking for an engineer to design digital sound effects and digital speech synthesis. And I thought, boy, that's something I can really do, right? I've done that for real in, in, in rock and roll. I, I'm really qualified for this. The only problem, of course, is I had no credentials whatsoever from any kind of school. So it was a different time. It wasn't like today when they can determine if you went to Harvard or you went to school here in 10 or 15 minutes of checking. And, uh, and the recruitment process wasn't exactly the same as it is today. So I talked to the engineering managers at Milton Bradley, and they were very impressed that I had made all these sound effects for these bands. And, you know, and a couple of them had seen me on television, on 
you know, 2020 and, you know, news stories and stuff like that, talking about the stuff with KISS. So that was like enough for them. They were ready to hire me. So they sent me down to the personnel office, and today they don't even call it personnel. Today, it's kind and gentle, and it's called human resources. But back then, when it was called personnel, the personnel boss, he was like a tough son of a bitch, and he had a baseball bat behind his desk. You know, it's very different from now. And, um, and so, because there was no internet to check what people said, and, and because at that time, most of the people who applied for jobs came from a local area, the personnel boss down there, he made it his business to, you know, know who the professors were at all the local colleges. And, and so, to evaluate the claims of people who came in there, he would, you know, he would ask them. And I, and I, I kind of misled him a little bit. I, I led them to believe that I, you know, I had a degree from the University of Massachusetts, even though it was true to say that I received my education there. That wasn't exactly accurate. But when I go in there for him to quiz me, he doesn't ask me about my classes and my scores and my grade point average. He says, did you know Professor Navon? Did you know Professor Walker? And, and he'd rattle off these names. And of course, I knew them all because I rode the school bus with their kids, you know? <laughs> and we all played together. And um, so, he didn't trip me up once. He even asked me about a fellow, and I said, sure, I know him, but he's not an electrical engineering professor. He's in mechanical engineering. And I could see he was impressed at that. So, they offered me the job. And it was only years later that I discovered that uh, he actually didn't just take my word for it. He called some of those professors. And, and you know, it turned out that when he called those professors, they said to him, oh yes, he's John Robeson's son in the philosophy department. He's a really bright young man. He would make a great engineer for you on, on sound effects. They all told him that. Not one of them said, but he was never actually a student at our university. They never said that. So anyway, that got me in the door and legitimate work. But, uh, you know, but I, uh, I felt like I was a fraud. And a couple of years later, I thought, you know, I've done this for two years here, and these people are going to discover any day now that I'm not a real engineer. I'm just a, a high school dropout, and I'm this loser kid. Now, I can look back on that time, and I can think that with KISS, before I went to Milton Bradley, we had these huge selling rock and roll albums and huge tours and all that other music. It was hugely successful. And at Milton Bradley, we had just brought out Microvision, you probably don't know what vision is today, but what I can tell you is Microvision was the first changeable cartridge handheld video game. It is the foundation your Game Boy and every cartridge video game you play today is built on. The patents for Microvision. We had Simon, we partnered with Texas Instruments and we made Speak and Spell, which was the biggest educational toy in history at that time. And yet, I believed I was a fraud and a failure, and I quit. And so I took another job, you know, because now I'd gotten a first job, it's pretty easy to, you know, bullshit my way into a second job and a third job. And so, next company I'm working for, well, it was actually a company after that, we got a contract to make some equipment for the Livermore National Labs. And uh, you heard that... Uh, I was introduced as the neurodiversity advisor for the Livermore Labs. But this was a long time before that. This was, you know, it was back in the 80s. And, um, and so they told me what the equipment they wanted me to design had to do. And, and it had to do things that could, had never been done and couldn't be proven. We didn't have any computers to simulate circuits that would do what they wanted done. And, um, but they had a system for testing it, and then they're going to they're use it in, in nuclear and weapons research. And, um, and so I designed the stuff to the best of my ability, and I was pretty convinced it would work. And uh, they send a group of engineers out from California, and they test the stuff. And, you know, they had designed all the tests, and all my equipment passed the tests. 
And they said, this is good, we'll take it, thank you. Don't ever tell anyone that we were ever here. Don't ever tell anyone about this. And, and by the way, your circuit diagrams are all classified and we'll take them with us now, thank you. And, um, and so I thought, okay, well that was fine. Well then, a little while later, I read in the news about these successful nuclear tests that we're doing, and, and this was a, a series where, um, where we were observing the Soviet tests and the Soviet observers were observing our tests. This is back when we still did you know, live nuclear testing. And, uh, and they come back to me and they want to order more. And the same old thing reared its head and I thought, holy shit. This is the federal government, and these people are serious, and the FBI is coming here. And it wasn't just the FBI, it was like the Defense Intelligence Agency. And these people are going to discover that I'm not an engineer, and I'm a high school dropout, and I'm this nothing kid, and they're going to put me in prison. That's even worse than getting fired. And I thought, I'm not going to do it anymore. And I left. And ultimately, I decided that I just wasn't going to be able to make it in electronics because I was a fraud and a failure. I always had a gift for machines too. And I thought, well, I'll start a business fixing cars because nobody asks where you went to school. If you're putting a water pump on your car, you know, and your toilet's clogged, you don't want to know where your plumber went to college. You just want the toilet to flush. And I thought, well, that's a safe thing for me to do. And, uh, and so... I started this car business and, and it actually was a success. Um, and, and a thing that I didn't realize at the time was that uh, I didn't really have many social skills then, didn't have many friends, but I had to learn to get along with people when they brought broken cars in because otherwise they wouldn't come back. And if they didn't come back, I wouldn't be able to keep the business going. Now by that time, not only did I have a girlfriend, but me and the girlfriend had gotten married and, and we had a kid. And so, you know, she was little bear and a kid was the bear cub and, and I now had to make money to feed the bear cub. It wasn't just me. And so I had this pressure to be successful. And, and you know, sometimes I would have trouble with customers who came in because even though I still wasn't confident talking to people about social things. And I was still terrified of, you know, pretty girls and handsome guys. And some of you probably know what it's like, you know, there were the, the beautiful people in high school, the cheerleaders and the swim team captains and the people I would never be. And, um, and, and so, so I couldn't talk to any of them, but I could absolutely talk to you with authority about the car. And I'd get people who'd come in and they'd, they'd say things like, here, I've printed these pages of the manual about how to diagnose my car and this is what, you know, this is what I want you to do. And I would say, you know, I don't need your papers to figure out what's wrong with the car. And they would say, what do you mean you don't need my papers? I spent a lot of time researching this. And I would say, well, if you've researched it, why didn't you just fix it yourself? What do you need me for? And, and they would, you know, they would get all flustered and they'd say, haven't you ever heard of the idea that the customer is always right? I would say, what kind of crazy shit is that? <laughs> if you were right, you would not be here. You are not a customer who has the answers. You are a fool with a broken car and you're looking for someone with the wisdom to fix it. If it was any different, you wouldn't be here at all. Now, some people couldn't handle that hard truth. Others could. So one of the fellows, by that time, who'd been sitting in the waiting room through a few of those encounters, was a fellow I got to be kind of friendly with, and we would talk, you know, we'd go to lunch and stuff. And one day after one of these encounters, he says to me, um, and he was a therapist, and he says to me, you know, John, I've been thinking for a long time whether I should say anything to you about this, because... One of the things you learn as a therapist is you don't try and diagnose your friends and pretty soon you won't have any friends. But he said, uh, said, you know, I've heard you tell me how lonely you feel and I've heard you tell me how you feel like you're 
standing outside in the cold rain and you're looking inside and all the people are standing around by the fire talking and having fun and you're out there in the, in the rain. And I've seen you have these unsuccessful interactions with customers that come in here. And he says, now I want you to know that there's a reason for that. And it's not your fault. He said, you know, there's this thing called Asperger syndrome. It's a kind of autism. And they just started talking about it in the mental health community. And he said, you could be the poster boy for it. And he says, it's not that there's something wrong with you. It's that you're different. And I just, you know, I, I said, what? And he was prepared. And he pulls out this book called Asperger syndrome. And he says, look, he says, I have highlighted in this book some things that I think, will, you know, will resonate with you. And he opens it up and he shows me this thing he's outlined that people with Asperger's are often fascinated by trains and machines. Of course, that was me. And he says, people with Asperger's often fail to read body language and they approach people too closely and make them feel threatened or they turn away when they're speaking and make them feel ignored. And, and that was me. And he goes through and he shows me like all these things, one after the other, every one of them is me. And, uh, and I said, okay, well, yeah, I guess that is me. How do I get cured? And he says, well, there is no cure. It's how you are. You have to, you know, learn to live with how you are. And he says, knowledge is power. You don't need a cure. There's nothing wrong with you. And, um, and it took me a long time to internalize that. You know, at, at first, I felt relief because... If you've been called a sociopath, a retard, a mental, all the other ugly stuff people called me, it's kind of a relief for somebody who's like a professional to say, no, you're none of those things. You're a person with autism. It's just how you were born. But then it would always come back to, there's no cure. You're always going to be this way. So he's told me why I don't have any friends. He's told me why I fail at all these things but he hasn't told me how I'm going to change it. And, um, and so a little while goes by, and I read and I reread that book, and I read more about it, and, you know, and I realized that, yes, all those things that the doctor who wrote that book wrote, they were all right. I, I would get close to people, and they would feel threatened by me. They would say, back off, you know, and I, I've heard that many times. People would say, you know, even from when I was a little boy, they would say, look at me, boy. Look at me when you're talking to me. A man looks a man in the eye. I'll bet a bunch of you have heard that. And I always thought I was looking at people. And I, I never thought I was threatening people when they would say to back off. But now that I knew about Asperger's, I realized it didn't matter what I thought because that's what they thought. And, and, and I started to think I could make rules for myself. I started to think, okay, so if I'm talking to you, I can kind of reach out and I can imagine that I'm not going to get any closer than two arm's lengths away from you. And then, whatever I say to you, you're not going to feel threatened. And you know, that worked. And, and with those other people who would say, well, you know, you're not paying any attention to me, you're ignoring what I say, I realized that if I'm walking with you, and I step up and I open the door for you, if I do things like that, I don't have to read your body language to open the door. And when I do that, every time I do that, you're going to think he's a nice guy. And so then you'll, you'll kind of pardon when I say or do some other dumb thing. And those things sound really trivial and simple, but, but for me, they were not. For me, it took years to learn that, and I cannot express to you enough how transformational that was for me in my life. And, and now, all of a sudden, I had friends, and, um, and ultimately, at that point, I decided that I would write a book about, uh, a book about autism and growing up with that, because a little bit before that, my brother had decided to write a book. So my younger brother, he wrote this book called Cellivision. And it was a novel, and it was about 
the depravity and perversion of an imaginary home shopping network. My brother had worked as, a, as an advertising writer, you know, and he worked with those kinds of things. So he wrote this book, and it was just kind of a, a harmless, you know, comedy novel. And, um, and so being a brother, I, I put it for sale at my car business. And people would come in, and my brother, you know, wrote under the name Augustine Burroughs because he didn't like our parents, and he changed his name when he turned 18. And, um, and people would come in, and they would say, why is this book for sale here? And the receptionist would say, oh, that's John's little brother. And, uh, and they would say, why has he got a different name? And, and she would say, well, he, he, that's the name he writes under. And so the people would buy the books, you know, because they were thinking, I'll be a loyal customer. I'll support John. I'll buy his brother's book, you know. And so people buy the book, and they come back, and they tell me it's funny, or they don't tell me anything at all. It's kind of no big deal, you know, have the books for sale. Well, then... I get this galley proof of my brother's second book. And it's this thing called Running With Scissors. And I open that book up, and the opening pages of the book are this guy who was like eight years older than me. And he was my best friend when I was 13 years old. He's having sex with my brother, who's like 10 years old in the book. My brother's eight years younger than me, so there's like a you know, gap in these incidents happening. And I was like horrified at that. I had no idea any of that happened. And, and I go on, and in this book, it's all about, you know, all this, you know, sex abuse and child abuse stuff. And, and you know, when, when I was a kid, my, um, my father was, was a violent drunk. And he'd, you know, he'd try and, you know, beat me and chase me around and stuff. And, but, you know, by this time, I was, you know, grown up. I was on my own. But my brother put it all in this book. Plus, there was the, uh, you know, child rape and there was all the other stuff like that. And I called my brother and he says, well, all that happened to you too. Why are you surprised at that? And, um, and, you know, that, uh, that prompted years of reflection on my part, wondering about the, the sex abuse and the child abuse, because, you know, that fellow in the story, John Chenille, who's having sex with my brother and running with scissors, he used to tell me, well, you know, John, you, you know, you're get the age where you're probably ready to learn about sex. And, you know, and the best way to learn about sex is from an older man. And, and the Romans and the Greeks, they knew about sex. And he would tell me about the Spartans and man-to-man -man sex. And that was the way to learn about sex and love and romance. And, of course, he, he could teach me. And I, and I always said, no, I, I want to get a girlfriend. And that was it, you know. I wanted to get a girlfriend. And... Um, and it took me years to come first to the conclusion that for whatever reason, nobody ever forced themselves upon me. And then I thought about, uh, I thought about, well, maybe there was more to the story because, you know, I left home and I joined bands. And, you know, there was a part in between when I was on the road with kids and, and when I was, you know, just in my hometown. And I was playing with some bands between me and Woodstock in some pretty rough places. And we were playing in biker bars with Disciples and Hell's Angels, and, and they were rough times. And, uh, and at those places, I always had a knife. I often had a gun. And now I realize you don't see it in me right now because I'm old and I've changed. But, but all those years ago, because I was autistic, I didn't have any expressions. Because I didn't have any social skills, I didn't have any responses. So these bikers, they would tell me these horrible stories about pulling people's teeth out with a pair of pliers and breaking this guy's, you know, breaking this guy's legs with a baseball bat and smashing this guy so hard they broke his motorcycle helmet and all this. They'd tell me all these horrible stories of mayhem. And I would just, you know, I would just kind of stand there and listen. Every now and then I'd, I'd reach back because I had my 45.
in the back of my pants, you know? And, uh, and I just listened to him. And I realized now that what they must have been thinking is they would tell me all this stuff and a typical person would be horrified and they would run from the place in horror. And I just kind of sat there and listened, said, yep, yeah, uh-huh, yep, yeah, let's have another beer. And, uh, and I think that they concluded because of my autism that I was not good to eat. Um, and people would, uh, people would come into these places and they would, you know, grab me by the crotch and they would put their, you know, they would grab me and stuff. And, you know, and I was the size I am now, but I was two or three times as strong. And it didn't work out too well grabbing me like that. And, um, and so, so I think for whatever reason, my autism protected me from the worst of what my brother experienced. I, I, it took me many years to realize that. And, you know, I look back on that time and I think autism made me quit one career after another because I believed I was a fraud. But it was autism that gave me the power of concentration and the ability to see the waves and the ability to shape the waves in my mind. And that's what made all those people want to hire me. So the very thing that made them want to hire me was the thing that made me run away from it. And the very thing that disabled me socially was the same thing that protected me from these sexual assaults and other things. Because really, all these rough places I was and all these horrible things I was around, nothing bad really ever happened to me. So, so anyway, I thought, after all that, that I would write a book about growing up because I thought, you know, I'd done things that people could probably relate to. And, um, and to my amazement, the book took off and became a bestseller all over the world. And, um, and at that time, there was such a strong sense that autism was a horrible disability. If your child has autism, you're going to be lucky if they can grow up to have any kind of normal life. And if you're lucky, they'll be able to live on their own. But otherwise, they're going to be living in your basement, you know, until you die. And um, it, was a, it was a bad, bad time to be reading about autism. The prognosis was very bad. But I thought, you know, my life was okay. You know, I had a wife. Well, by that time, the wife had turned and I'd gotten divorced. But I'd got me another wife. And, you know, I still had the kid. And the business was, you know, doing okay. I, I was doing all right. And, um, and I had started going and talking to, uh, to groups of people who were disadvantaged. I was talking to young people who were taken by the child protective people and put in safe homes. I was talking to pre-release people in the jails, but I couldn't find people with autism. And I thought, I will uh, write me a book about it. And that's what led to, to look me in the eye. And uh, one of the results of that was that I got invited to advise on research, the director of our National Institutes of Health, almost as soon as that book came out, he asked me if I'd come speak at the National Institutes of Health. And he asked me if I'd speak at a few other conferences. And I was, I was frankly quite frightened that I was going to be talking to all of these, uh, you know, all of these e educated uh, gentlemen of science, if you will, and government. And uh, to my amazement, they treated me with great respect and kindness. And... Um, and they, you know, they welcomed me. They asked me if I would advise the government because they said that we really need the perspective of people who live with autism, not as a parent, but people who are autistic. And, and you seem to be that rare person who has lived to adulthood and you can tell us what it's been like being a child, being a grown-up. You can tell us about getting married and having a kid. And, um, and I thought, okay. And, uh, you know, and the, the director promised me that everyone in public health would answer any question I ever had. And that proved to be true. And so when you think about people arguing about fighting for our rights and fighting for disability rights and so on, I, I want to tell you that there are people in our government who believe passionately in, in disability rights and they welcomed me. They, I did not fight to be there. 
And um, ultimately, I was invited to take part in a study at Harvard Medical School um, that was aimed at using pulses of electromagnetic energy to change the way I would think. They th this is not like electroshock therapy. This is a, a very different thing. This was pulsing, you know, microscopic amounts of energy, but enough energy to change the balance of the connections within your brain with a view to changing how I might be able to perceive emotions in other people. And, um, and I did that. And uh, they told me, you know, we're not going to run out of time here, are we? Have I been rambling on too long? Is there someone in authority here? Are we, are we okay? All right. He's no, okay. And you're okay, right? You're all okay? All right. So, all right. So, so anyway, um, he says to me, we're going to uh, bring you in this room and we're going to show you faces on a computer monitor and, and you're going to have buttons to push. And, and this is an easy test. He says, you go see the face, and, and you're going to have a button. It's going to be happy or sad. And, and you're going to just have to pick. And, um, and the faces start flashing in front of me. And the first thing I said, I said, hey, I can't do this. These faces are going way too fast. And, and he says, he says, I'm sorry, you know, that's, that's, that's the point. He said, we're showing you these faces really fast because we want to test your instinct and not your ability to reason through what you're seeing. So we, we cannot, we're showing you these things to distinguish your reasoning from your instinct. I said, okay. And, um, and they turned the thing back on. And I had absolutely no clue what I was seeing. Whether it was happy, it was sad, it was eager, it was jealous, it was anxious, I couldn't answer a single one of them. And he says to me, don't worry, John, there's no real right and wrong answer here. There's no, it's not like a passing or failing score. He said, we just want to compare the results now with the results after we do the stimulation. And I thought, well, that's a load of bullshit. There's no such thing as a test where there's no right score. But I was sort of polite, and I didn't say that to him. And, um, and so, um, so anyhow, they hold this thing up to my head, and it starts pulsing. And it goes tick, tick, tick every second. And, uh, and I'm sitting there in a chair, and I think, okay, I'm going to count the pulses until this is done. It's going to be like 20 minutes. And I count. One, two, three, four. I kind of lose track. And I start over. And the same thing happens. And I realize I'm kind of in a trance with this thing. And then all of, and there's a, it's got a loud fan. It's really loud in the background. And all of a sudden, the fan goes off. And he says, that's it. We're done. It's been 20 minutes. I didn't even realize the time had passed. And he says, come on. You got to sit down. And we're going to do the test again. I said, why do we have to hurry so much? And he says, well, you know, if we stimulate you for 20 minutes, we think the effect might only last for 10 minutes. And I think, well, if the effect's only going to last for 10 minutes, why even bothering with it, you know? What difference does it make? But I didn't say that either. And I go over and I sit down, and he puts the faces in front of me. And I still don't have a clue. And at the end of it, you know, I think, what kind of crazy fool was I to think that these people are going to, you know, fire this electromagnetic energy into my head and it was going to, you know, change me like that. And uh, so I'm ready to go. Well, I live two hours west of Harvard. And uh, so I got, you know, got to drive home. And uh, couldn't drive home, though, yet, because another neurologist has to come up and examine me and test my reflexes and do some more tests to make sure that I'm not going to have a seizure or collapse in the car. Asks me what day it is and who's president and stuff like that. And I was able to answer. And, and so they let me go. And, uh, and I get in the car, and, uh, and I start heading home. And, and a lot of times when I was riding in the car, I'd play old recordings. You know, you all have heard of bootleg musical recordings, right? And, uh, and I had bootleg recordings back from when I was doing music. And, um, and so there was, a, there was a band that I, I happened to play that night. 
This band called Tavares. Any of you ever hear of the movie Saturday Night Fever? Yeah, it's a really, really big movie in the 70s. Well, a lot of people associate Saturday Night Fever with the Bee Gees, but uh, Tavares actually sang some of those songs. There's a few other bands on there, and it was you know, a really big thing for all of them. So I had a recording of Tavares playing in Boston, you know, right near where the hospital was some years before, and I turned that on. And it was like I had dropped into this musical hallucination. It was like I was back in the 1970s and I could like smell the cigarette smoke backstage and the lights and, and I was just, I was just overwhelmed by the detail of the music. And, and the thing is, for the first time in my life, I could feel the emotion of the singers, and even today, it affects me just to think of how that hit me that night. I, I felt the emotion of the singers, and I, I realized that, you know, this is a song about someone's love for someone else or someone's sadness that, that someone left them or their dreams of a life together. And I realized that that's what this music was all along. It was, it was all these hopes and dreams. And... And you know, I never knew that. I, I knew how to deliver the music clearly. I was so proud, you know, that I could, I could go into a big, a big outdoor arena and I could, I could deliver ringing clear piano and vocals and everyone could hear it, but I never knew what it meant. And then I did. And... Uh, and I sat up all night, and I listened to music. And, and gradually it faded away, and I couldn't, I couldn't feel it anymore. And, uh, and I went to work. But before I went to bed, it was dawn when I went to bed. And, uh, and I wrote the doctor, and I said, she got some powerful mojo in that machine. And I went to bed, and I got up, and I went to work about lunchtime, and I walk in, and one of the other guys is walking down, down the hall, and I look at him, and, um, and I think to myself, he has the most beautiful brown eyes. And, and it struck me, you know, all my life, I couldn't even tell what, what my own wife's eyes looked like. I never saw people's eyes. I never, ever had a thought like that in my life before. And, uh, and everything was just turned upside down for me. I had gone into that, uh, that research thinking that my problem was that I couldn't see these emotions in people, and if only I could see them, everything would be better for me. But when I could see them, what I saw, you know, I, there were those moments of beauty like I just told you, but all the people around me, I saw so much fear and sadness and anguish and jealousy, and it almost made me kill myself. It almost drove me to suicide the winter after I took part in that, in that TMS. And, um, but you know, the thing that I got out of it they did all these tests on me. They tested my ability to solve problems. And there was this one problem solving a puzzle, you know, that they, uh, you know, they give me to, to, ta to solve. And, and I thought it took a long time, you know, it took like, I don't know, a couple of minutes to solve it. And, uh, and I said to them after, I said, what's the, you know, I said, what's the average person take to solve that? If you think that's good that I took so long, long but what? What's the average person take? And he said, well, the average person can't solve it at all. And, um, and I, uh, for the first time, working for those pe with those people in, at Harvard in this research, they showed me that the problems I had all my life were not because of any of these things. I mean, it was one thing to have a person say, you have autism, it was entirely another for a person to switch it off.
for a little while and have me see emotion instead of logic. But you know, when I could see emotion instead of logic, what did it do for me? It made me like the majority of the rest of the world. And, and what did I want to do with it? I wanted to commit suicide. You know, on New Year's Eve, the year we did that, I sat on the bank of the Connecticut River in my BMW thinking, should I drive it into the water? And, you know, and... Uh, and it was my being a freak and my being different. It was my logic. It was my ability to, to see the waves and to make the waves do what I wanted. It was that stuff that no one else could do. That made me special in the world. That was what made me successful. And, and you know, Alvaro, Alvaro Pascal Leon, it's the name of the doctor who led that research. And, uh, and I wrote the story of this in a book called Switched On, and Alvaro actually wrote a foreword for the book. If you're curious, you can read it. Um, but Alvaro said to me, after all this research, study stuff was done, he said, you know, sometimes I think autistic people are nature's engineers. And you can't, you know, you couldn't pass school, you couldn't learn English, you couldn't learn, you couldn't learn math the way they wanted to teach those things to you. And, and he said, you know, you've said to me that you feel like you're a fraud. But he said, I don't even have to ask you if this stuff is true. I mean, there's this abundant evidence of all these things that you've done in the public domain. Do you truly believe that a lucky fool could have just guessed right time after time? And I said, well, I didn't always guess right. Lots of stuff I did went up in smoke. And he said, yeah, well, it went up in smoke, but you accomplished more. And you accomplished it in different domains. He said, you did it in musical engineering. You did it in military signal processing. You did it writing books. You did it in photography. You did it in automobile technology. He said, hardly anyone does that. And he said, the only conclusion, you know, that I would come to as a scientist is that these things live in you. You know, you don't, you didn't need the school. They lived in you. And he says, I think autistic people are nature's engineers. And, um, and I guess it was that, you know, that made me realize that I am a complete correct human with all my defects and all my abilities. And I, I am not possessed of equal abilities to most people in many domains. I still can't talk to a pretty girl. I'm still intimidated by the 60-year-old version of the high school quarterback or, you know, swim team captain. I still can't talk to those people. But you know, those people, they come up to me now at book events and they say, I can't believe how beautifully you expressed how I felt in school. And I used to hear that, and I would look at them and think, you've got to be bullshitting me, you know? I mean, you were, you were the star of the school. I was the loser of the school. And I thought I had written a book about how people like me were different. But now I see that I didn't. I wrote a book about how we are all the same and as different as you may have thought I was. We actually are all the same inside. And... It's been such a remarkable journey, you know, for me to have experienced that. It was that book that opened the door to that research. It was Francis Collins and the others inviting me to join them in the National Institutes of Health. All those years after I said those people at the Livermore Lab will put me in prison if they realize I'm a fake engineer, the lab invited me back and they said, John, there's still people who worked on those programs with you and they would love to see you back here. And, uh, you know, and I realized that it was all in my mind, the things that made me a failure. And today, thanks to my service in helping guide autism science, I've had the privilege of learning and seeing so much that other people, even, you know, doctors and scientists don't see. I realized that autism, autism is at its heart an inherited difference, not a disease. And autism is part of this 
family of differences we call neuro being neurodivergent. Neurodiversity is the idea that just as you have people that are tall, people who are short, people who are heavy, people who are light, people with different color hair, some people are really smart, some people are not so smart, some people have incredible memory, some people don't know what they did yesterday. Part of that is neurological diversity, just as we have physical diversity, but we've never thought about it until now. And so, these heritable traits, ADHD, dyslexia, autism, I would hear parents would say, my child's autism isn't like your autism because I have to cut the labels off my daughter's clothes because they scratch her and they make her crazy. And, she can't, and, she, and, and they would say to me, who in his right mind would think that's any kind of gift. And, and my son is overwhelmed by any smells or flashing lights and he won't even go to school because of the lights in the school. And who would want that? Well now with the benefit of a couple decades of study of this, I realize that evolution doesn't move so fast and if you cast yourselves back to the ice age and you think about our ancestors and for many of us, our ancestors are living on the boundaries of the ice in the Northern Hemisphere. And for us to find shelter to survive, we need to go into caves. But those caves were not alone in the caves. There's cave lions and cave bears. And those creatures are to today's mountain lions like kitty cats are to the lions in the zoo. And if you went into a cave with a lion or a bear, not only were you likely to die, but your whole tribe would die with you. And so, for the tribes that survived, there was a freak or two among them. And those freaks were the ones that could sense any scratchiness and they could smell any smell, and they could hear any sound, and they could see any light. And those were the people who could go into the caves, and they could tell if it was safe. But it wasn't just in the cold parts of the world. In the Southwest Pacific, you read stories about how people voyaged from Southeast Asia, and they colonized Australia, they sailed 5,000 miles to colonize Tahiti and Hawaii, and now we find that they not only sailed to Easter Island, they sailed all the way to the coast of South America. They crossed the largest trackless ocean on Earth. And they did that before we had not only navigational instruments, we didn't even have any written communication. And how did they do it? They did it the same way the autistic freak kid that memorizes all the stars memorize the stars today. They did it the way that freak kid who is disabled because he senses motions and things like that. But the version of that kid all those years ago, he could lay as an adult on the floor of those canoes and he could read the patterns of the waves from the way the canoe moved. He could read his position on earth or her position. Actually, Polynesian navigators, we know, were male and female in similar numbers. The navigators were able to navigate what others saw as trackless ocean with accuracy and time after time take their tribes to safety through abilities that most people don't have. That is the power of neurodiversity not just to move us forward, but to keep our species alive. And I suggest to you that every single one of those people was disabled in everyday life, just like I was disabled, and just like some of you are disabled, because maybe you naturally see things backwards, and today you're disabled because you can't read. Maybe you're disabled today because of your sensory sensitivities. But those very same things kept us alive. And those are the reasons that we inherit those traits today. 
And even though we're disabled by those traits, and we're disabled in other ways, for example, those of us who are very logical, we can't understand the emotional issues of people who are speaking with us. And, and I'll grant you that is a lifelong disability for me. But when you need my logic, you need my logic, right? And, and, and the same for you. Imagine that we are crossing the street and you fall down and you skin your knee. A compassionate person would look at you and say, oh, you're bleeding, that hurts, I, I can feel it, I know you must be hurting. Here, let me lean down and, and, and let me put my arm around you and comfort you. I, who am a logical autistic person, don't feel your pain. I don't feel your suffering. I'm rational though. I see that you have fallen. I see that you have skinned your knee. I see that your leg is not broken. There are cars coming, and I say to you, come on, get out of the street, that car's coming fast, because if you don't get your ass out of the street, you're gonna die. So, I didn't give you the considerate, compassionate response, but I gave you the response that saved your life. And, and I'm certainly not saying that I am unique in doing that. Any logical person would do the same. Many of you remember Mr. Spock on Star Trek, right? He was, uh, he was the picture of that for us. And, and I had the privilege of actually uh, meeting Mr. Spock in my hometown in our latter years. But um, that, uh, that is the reason that we are here. And now science tells us that neurodiversity, rep, neurodivergent people represent about one in eight people. And I think that's probably a pretty reasonable ratio, right? 90% of the things that human beings do, they can probably do them better than me and some of you. But the times they need us, boy, they do need us. And that's why we're here and we're here to stay. And now that we understand neurodiversity, it's also important for us to understand how modern society has taken our gifts and made them into parlor tricks. Modern medicine and the psychiatry community has focused very effectively on showing us what we can't do. You can't read body language, you don't behave right, you act up in school, this is why you're a failure. And they have made the generation you belong to, my generation, they've made all of us grow up feeling like we are second-rate humans because they have told us what's wrong with us. Day after day after day as children, we hear this bullshit. This is what's wrong with you. This is why you're less than someone else. It is just as ugly as institutionalized racism, but let me tell you an important difference between being a neurodivergent person who's bullied and called a retard and a sped and other stuff, and a black kid in school hearing the same ugly racist talk from kids. Here's the difference. The black kid or the Hispanic kid or the Chinese kid, any kid who is marginalized by racism can go home and tell their mom and dad what has happened. And mom and dad can say, Son, those people are telling you these things to tear you down to build themselves up and these are ugly racist lies and what they say isn't true and our culture has a history of thousands of years of accomplishment. Here are the leaders of our group and here are our leaders in the community. Here are our leaders in Washington. Here are our leaders in history. With every marginalized racial group, wh whether it's a, a black group, a Jewish group, any group, the parents can show the children the heroes. And the children can think, I can, I can be one of them one day. I can grow beyond those people who call me names. But look at me. I'm a, I'm a little white boy. I'm supposed, to be, I'm supposed to be the privileged class. What's my mother going to say to me? Oh, son, you're, you're not really a retard. You're not really stupid. They're all going to love you one day. What's my mother going to say? In the absence of knowledge of neurodiversity, there's nothing my mother could say. And that's why we grow up as second-class people. And that's why in civil rights, you have strong, proud people who say, yes, I grew up Mexican, I grew up black, 
and I'm strong, and I'm a leader, but we hardly have anyone of my generation who will stand up and say, I'm autistic, and I'm proud to be different, and I'm strong too, and I'll stand, and I'll show you what you can be. This is what my life has been in your life, because you were growing up with knowledge of neurodiversity and I didn't. You have every advantage over me. You're at a college, you're in a good college. You have awareness of neurodiversity. There's no limit to where you can go. Every success that I've achieved, you can achieve better. And, and that's what we need. And that's what we have to build. And that's what I would say is your charge. Because I would like to see that I represent the last generation of neurodivergent people to grow up as second-rate humans. Neurodiversity knows no racial boundaries. It knows no sexual boundaries. It's men, it's women, boys, girls. It's every race, every religion, every culture. We are all speckled with neurodivergent people. And we need to find ourselves and we need to build pride. Just as we have Africa houses, we have Spanish houses, we have Hillel houses, we have, we have houses that are homes and centers for people of different cultures and races at colleges all over the country. You are the generation that is going to speak out and say, we need a neurodiversity house next to Africa House. We need to recognize that we are brothers and sisters in advocacy. We stand for our rights. We don't claim that we are better than anyone else, but we certainly are not less. And we wish to assert our position in the world. And, and I would say that is the charge for all of you. And I, I wish you the best of success in doing it. And I hope that you can do it that you can be strong because people are going to say ugly, mean shit to you just like they said it to me. And the more you speak out, the more ugly stuff you're going to hear. But it's you. You've got to be strong because you have the knowledge. You are the first generation of neurodivergent people to come of age knowing what you are and knowing your potential. And I don't mean knowing what you are with the bullshit of the past. Of, of what a failure you are, you know the potential to be stars. Not everyone has to be a genius. We have to be what we are. And being what we are is good enough, whatever our abilities. And we have to stand for that. And we have to stand for who and what we are. So with that, I believe that we have Still got room for questions. None of you got up and left, so hopefully you, you will have questions. Now, I'm going to be doing four talks during the day tomorrow. And I don't actually know how these talks are organized, and I don't know how, they are, how they're set up. But I hope that you can find out on the college's website. And if any of you want to see me in a less big setting as this, I hope that you'll, you, some of you will join me. And, and right now, if you want to ask any questions or open up any other topics for discussion, I'm, uh, I'm ready to hear it. Now, I can't see real well back there because there's bright light, um, but do we have a microphone for uh, folks? Hold on a second. Hopefully they haven't all deserted me. There. Okay. What are we going to do for uh, questions? Um, why don't we hold off on questions and... If people have questions, they can ask you at the book signing table. Okay, do you want to, I think I've run over time and they've been polite, not pulled me off the stage. Okay, well, th thank you. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And, uh, and I hope you also have enjoyed my slides. You know, I know that as college students, you go to classes and you, you sit through hours and hours of boring PowerPoint presentations and slides. And these are just things I see in my travels around that I thought, well, this will provide you some relief from that. So thank you again. I'll see you out there with the book signings and I'll see you, some of you tomorrow.